Tonight on The Late Debate, Plan B begins, working from home is back and central London is braced. It will be a devastating blow to businesses that are desperately needing to get some much needed cash in the tills in the run up to Christmas. Also on the programme, the hangover from last Christmas and that video, three government gatherings are being investigated and it's been a terrible year for the Met, how does the force restore its battered reputation? Good evening. It all feels so familiar, doesn't it? Rising Covid cases, working from home and wearing masks. But after a video was leaked of Downing Street officials laughing about a party that may or may not have broken last year's laws, will the public listen this time? In central London, there are fears the economy will miss out on a crucial Christmas boost. Working from home is the Christmas present the West End feared. For shops, bars and restaurants struggling to recover from the pandemic, Plan B is a body blow. Working from home means that people won't be socialising when they're out in the office and, and that you will see a, an immediate downturn in footfall and revenues for those businesses that have struggled to recover the most. But some theatre owners breathed a sigh of relief. Masks are now compulsory, but at least they're still open. We're just going to get more and more used to it generally, aren't we? And if that's the price for staying safe, it doesn't seem to be that big a price to me. This fictional party was a business meeting. <laughs> And it was not socially distanced. Just hours before Plan B was announced, the Prime Minister was firefighting arguably the biggest crisis of his career. The leaked video of a pretend news conference where officials laughed at reports of an illicit Downing Street party led Boris Johnson to make an unprecedented Commons apology. I was also furious to see that clip. And Mr Speaker, I apologise. I apologise unreservedly for the offence that it has caused up and down the country, and I apologise for the impression that it gives. Millions of people now think the Prime Minister was taking them for fools yeah, yeah. and that they were lied to. Yeah, yeah. They're right, aren't they? Yeah. Shortly afterwards, the Downing Street aide in the video resigned. My remarks seemed to make light of the rules, rules that people were doing everything to obey. That was never my intention. But Allegra Stratton's departure won't draw a line under this. As the Cabinet Secretary began an investigation into the party, reports of more social gatherings in lockdown emerged. Joining me now are three party political animals who would never dream of breaking the rules. For Labour, the Putney MP Fleur Anderson. For the Conservatives, the Bromley and Chislehurst MP Sir Bob Neill. And from another studio for social distancing reasons, the Liberal Democrat MP for Richmond Park, Sarah Olney. Bob, Boris Johnson's in serious trouble, isn't he? Well, this has been badly handled, and let's make no bones about that. It's right that there's been an investigation. It's right that there's been an apology um, for what was clearly unprofessional and uh, offensive behaviour in making light uh, of a potential breach of the rules. Uh, but uh, my great regret is this wasn't done at the very beginning, because it's distracted, actually, from a lot of good things that are being done uh, and from, actually, the main message uh, of getting, on, getting people vaccinated. Is the Downing Street machine it. a shambles? I think the Downing Street machine uh, lacks experience. Um, you remember when the mayor was at, when Boris was at City Hall, he had very experienced people like Simon Milton uh, and Eddie Lister running uh, the organisation side for him. And I think he needs some people who've got some um, gravitas and who've got some long experience of administration uh, and perhaps uh, uh, of politics to help himself, actually. But if he hasn't got the right people around him, that's a lack of leadership, isn't it? Well, I think we've had a turnover of uh, perhaps sometimes good reasons with the departure of one chief of staff. But I do think uh, that you... If you've got a big job like Prime Minister, but you've got uh, so much else on your plate, you've got to be able to delegate. Boris did it very well when he was mayor and actually was very successful. So he can do it, uh, but I think he's been let down on this occasion uh, and the consequences have not helped anybody. Sarah, your party is hoping to take a safe Tory seat uh, for, uh, in, in the Midlands at a by-election next week. You must be loving this. Um, no, Simon, really I'm not. I think this is absolutely appalling, the way the Prime Minister is behaving. And I think, I mean, Bob's right, this is, it's come at such a critical time. We may be uh, entering new restrictions, and what we really need is for the country to pull together 
uh, and to do what needs to be done to fight off the, the Omicron variant, just as we're coming into the Christmas season and people want so desperately to be able to spend Christmas with their families this year. It is so important that we have the right moral leadership from the top and this whole situation has been an absolute farce and it is really undermining trust, not just in the government, but in their whole approach to managing this pandemic. And I am really, really concerned about the consequences of that. Fleur, in the comments today, you wanted more information about the investigation into this party and others. How many offences do you think have been committed? Well, that's just it. We just don't know what the extent of this is. And that's really worrying. And that's making people so angry. How many parties were there? There seem to be more and more coming to light all the time. Who were at these parties? Were the people who are now investigating it even at these parties? And what kind of thing does it say about the, that decision making and, and, the, and the judgment of those who are making decisions? Bob seems to be saying it's quite cosmetic. It's just about the video or about managing um, communications at number 10. I think it goes much deeper than that and, and the way decision making is being done by the government at the moment and that's what's really worrying at a time when we have to have so much trust that the decisions are correct for our health. Are you certain Labour didn't have any parties that uh, broke the rules last year? Absolutely, I don't know of any parties. We were, at, we were following the rules just like constituents who've contacted me saying we followed the rules. Uh, it's, it's shocking and it's shocking that it's been covered up for a year as well. Why is it only coming up a year later? So no, there weren't any parties on our side but what was going on in various government departments? Bob, it's the oldest rule in politics, isn't it? It's, it's not the mistake that gets you, it's the cover-up. Well, that's right. It's always best to be upfront about things. If, if, if something has gone wrong, do it straight away. I always think I'm always very wary of uh, uh, throwing stones at the other side just in case something does come out, frankly, on one's own side. Uh, but I think people did do their best to follow the rules. Uh, and you can't have a ru one rule for, for, for one set of people and a different rule for everybody else. So, of course, that it should have been closed down much sooner and it should have been jumped on when it happened. We hear that Sean Bailey, the Conservative mayoral candidate last year, had a small party at Conservative HQ last Christmas. Uh, some members, staff members were disciplined, but it does give the impression of the Conservatives that they were all at it. Uh, well, I, I can think of one Conservative who wasn't at it, that's for sure, and he's sitting here, and I know a lot of other colleagues were. Some of us were very unhappy about some of the restrictions, actually, uh, and uh, questioned them in, in Parliament. But when they're brought into law, everybody has to obey them. That, that's basic. Uh, and that's why it is very regrettable, uh, to put it mildly, that these things happened. Uh, and it would be wrong whichever party it was uh, that they happened with. So we've got to make sure that this never happens again. And you're quite right, we've got to make sure that people have faith in the system restored, because we need everybody to accept that they're, they're, they're in this fairly together. Sarah, you say it's important that people, as Bob has just said, uh, trust the messages. But do you think voters really cared that much about parties a year ago? I think they care a great deal, Simon. Uh, people have made sacrifices and it meant a great deal to people uh, not to be able to spend Christmas with their own loved ones, especially people who, who've lost their loved ones this year and didn't get the opportunity to spend that final Christmas with them. Um, but they did it because it was the right thing to do, because they were told it was for the good of, of the whole community. And so to find that the people actually making those rules didn't observe them themselves, went right ahead and, and had a party and laughed about it, it just, it really, really upsets people. So yes, I think it is really, really important. Bob, you mentioned the fact that you weren't keen on some of the restrictions. Do you think the row over this party has amplified the disquiet over Plan B among backbenchers on the Tories? Well, it, I, I think it's it certainly raised concerns there, and I think it may make it harder uh, with the public uh, as well. I mean, I have concerns and reservations about the current Plan B as well, but overwhelmingly, I know my Conservative colleagues, whatever our reservations, made sure that we all complied with the rules. Tiny minority have let us down, and there should be consequences for that. Um, but I do have some reservations. I do think it's been made harder. Will you vote for Plan B next week? Not as it stands, but I will wait to see what exactly are the details of the regulations. I, I, I take the point from your one of, one of the people you interviewed. You know, I don't think wearing masks in, in additional places is, is, is any great issue. I, I don't have a problem with that at all. What I'm concerned about is the position of the work from home directive and the impact that will have on London's economy. Um, I haven't yet seen any adequate impact assessment of that, though we have seen suggestions that the government's own figures suggest that could cost uh, the economy about £800 million a week in London. And I've got hospitality firms who get in touch with me now and say, well, look, you know, if every time there is a variant, uh, then we're going to move into these shutdowns, 
then th this will decimate our businesses. We will go under. So I'm really concerned about that aspect of it, and I think I need to see much more evidence to justify that as being proportional before I'm prepared to, to support that. Fleur, is it difficult for Labour? Your party wanted to go further than, than Plan B is, has at the moment. If there is a Tory rebellion, you really can't uh, join the Tory rebellion, you can't abstain, you, you, you're duty bound to back Plan B, aren't you? Even though you could cause the government an awful lot of embarrassment. It's not how to back the right thing to do for public health at the moment and not to play party politics with that. So if these are the, this is the right thing to do and looking at the figures of how contagious the Omicron variant is, it is certainly very concerning. We do not want to be in a very different place in a month, six weeks time when hospitalizations have already gone up and we do not have the ability to stop it. We do have the ability, we've always said, act fast in these times. So we have to agree with these um, relatively limited additional um, restrictions uh, before and, and then wait to see more about the Omicron variant. So it's, it's not hard to vote for the right thing to do for public health. Sarah, if you talk to constituents this weekend in Richmond and they ask you, why should we obey the rules when we see what's going on in Downing Street, what do you say to them? Well, I would just say to them, uh, you know, just echoing Fleur, it's the right thing to do. And, and it isn't difficult, as Bob was saying, and, and, and the lady in your piece there. It's just about wearing a mask. It's about keeping a distance. You know, test as much as you can, because obviously the symptoms of COVID are not always evident. So test, test, test. Make sure you're safe to be mixing with people. Um, and, and I don't think that those are onerous uh, um, requirements on anybody. And I just, uh, it's, it's the right thing to do. We've got to keep people safe. I totally understand people's fury with the government, but I don't think we should allow that to put us off from doing everything we can to get through this pandemic and get to the other side as soon as we possibly can. Can I ask you as a, an MP that uh, represents an outer London constituency, as indeed Bob does, uh, does Richmond benefit from working from home or Richmond's economy in a way that uh, central London doesn't with, with, these, with Plan B? It's quite a mixed picture, actually, uh, Simon. We do have quite a high proportion of white-collar workers, um, and certainly we saw in the first lockdown that, um, that uh, sort of household incomes in, in, in Richmond sort of remain quite high. People were, were in work and they were carrying on working. And we certainly found that some of our neighbourhood shops and some of our local high streets did did quite well because people were home during the day and they wanted to get out and about and they were rediscovering their local high street. So it is quite a mixed picture. But as Bob was saying, this, this sort of news, this uncertainty does have a massive impact on hospitality. And we have some wonderful restaurants and bars and cafes uh, in all my local high streets. And they're the ones who will be really suffering. Um, and again, I, I'm concerned for our retail. If people were planning a Christmas shopping trip this weekend and are thinking that perhaps they might stay home and order online instead, that's going to have an impact on them. So, like I say, it's a bit of a mixed picture. Bob, final question on what's been happening this week. Will Boris Johnson still be leader of the party at the next election? I have no reason to think otherwise. Yeah. OK, thank you. Question that. You would question that. Absolutely. I, don't, I think um, he's on very, very difficult ground now. Decision after decision. It's, just, it's not just been about these parties. It's also been about second jobs and seeing what the, the MPs are doing. It's been about the COVID contracts. Things, just so many issues now piling up. I don't know if we can really look at Boris Johnson's position as being very secure. OK. Now, 2021 is the year the Metropolitan Police will be keen to see the back of. A serving police officer guilty of rape and murder, two others guilty of sharing images of dead sisters murdered in a Wembley park, public confidence in the force is at a low ebb, and questions remain about whether the Commissioner, Cressida Dick, is the leader to restore it. The kidnap and murder of Sarah Everard in March was the first in a chain of events which have dented the reputation of London's police force. Do you know Sarah? I don't know. It was bad enough her killer, Wayne Cousins, was a serving police officer. Bad enough, there was evidence he was a dangerous misogynist. Sarah Everard, save my name! Sarah but then, just days after her body was found, officers used lockdown rules to forcibly break up a vigil in her memory on Clapham Common. That protest being met with police violence was, was a, a, you know, a, an alarming uh, moment, and I think it has galvanised a, a change in um, a trust of the policing, particularly from, from young women, I think. In July, the Met was wrong-footed again when fans without tickets were able to storm Wembley Stadium before the Euros final. It led to the head of an inquiry ordered by the FA to draw this conclusion last week. We were seconds away from a Hillsborough-type disaster in terms of potential fatalities and life-changing injuries.
In October, an inquest in Barking revealed disturbing aspects of the Met's investigation into the deaths of four young gay men murdered by the serial killer Stephen Port. A senior officer admitted there were missed opportunities to arrest Port. He apologised to their families. On Monday, two Metropolitan Police officers were jailed for sharing pictures on WhatsApp of the bodies of two sisters murdered in Wembley. Once more, there were questions about the prevailing culture within the force. The Metropolitan Police has always had an aggressive style of policing, arresting more than proceeding by way of summons, always using stop and search more than other police forces, uh, which has added to this male, uh, macho dominated culture. In the wake of the Everard case, the Commissioner announced a review into standards and the culture in her force. I am gravely concerned about what has happened. The police in this country, in this city, depend on the public's consent and depend on their trust. These awful events have damaged that. 2021 also saw yet more teenagers dying violently on the streets of London, the highest number of victims in a decade. The panel's still here with me for Labour MP Fleur Anderson, for the Conservatives MP Sir Bob Neill and remotely the Liberal Democrat MP Sarah Olney to discuss the Met's problems this year. Bob, you're a, a lawyer, a chairman of the Justice Select Committee, a long-time observer of policing. What's gone wrong in the Met and how do they fix it? Well, I, it's, it, it is troubling because there's some really good and brave people on the front line in the Met and one ought to remember that, uh, but I do think things are going wrong. I think there's something, a problem with the chain of command. I think there's something wrong with the priorities. We've got areas where I think there has been insensitivity at the very, put it mildly, shown in the way, for example, some areas have been policed and some basic things not being got right, for example, in Wembley at the crowd control. And at the same time, in a constituency like mine in the London suburbs, um, we don't have really have enough officers. And frankly, you try and get someone to investigate a burglary in Bromley, uh, then you're really struggling. And I think a lot of my constituents feel that the priorities aren't right. Uh, and that's really got to be sorted out from the top down. Sarah, your party earlier this year called for the Commissioner to quit. What do you think should be done to sort out the mess? Well, we still think that, and uh, so many other things have happened since. That, that was just after the, uh, the Clapham Common vigil, which was in your report there. Uh, and, and the thing that I felt most strongly about that was, was the, the, the failure to recognise that for women in particular, how undermining they found it, that the person who'd been arrested for Sarah Everard's murder was a police officer, and how fundamentally unsafe that makes people feel when they know they can't even trust the police to keep them safe. And I really feel, and I still feel very strongly, that that's something that the, that the Met, in the way they responded to that particular incident, really, really failed to understand. But we've seen so many other uh, incidents since then, as your report has said, and you haven't even talked about, for example, the, the report into the Daniel Morgan case, which was very critical of the extent of obstruction that the, the Met gave to that investigation. Uh, and, and it's just, it's, it's really clear that we need some kind of sea change in the Met uh, in, to, to culture, to, to priorities, as Bob was saying there. Um, and I just don't see how that can happen, how the Met can demonstrate to Londoners that they've changed, that they understand the concerns, that they're doing what's necessary to regain trust without a change of leadership. Fleur, Sadiq Khan endorsed the new contract for, for the Commissioner. Was he wrong? What do you think should happen? I think the, the clock is ticking for Cresta Dick's leadership. I think she needs to, a, a absolute change in the next year. It has been a terrible year for the Met and really undermined trust. I've been out recently with a group of our Violets Reduction Unit. And those officers are hardworking, trustable. They, they rely on really good um, ev evidence-led policing, police work. And they risk their lives every time they jumped out of that van when I was with them. So I have a lot of tr respect for our hardworking police officers. But there's a streak within the, the Met that allows racism, misogyny, uh, um, homophobia, and that undermines the rest of the work there. So we have to see some big changes. But it's not just the Met in isolation that can tackle the, the crime on, in our streets. Um, in Roehampton, for example, there's a lot of concern. And every time I'm there, I talk about the crime issues there. It's also about the numbers of police officers. They've been absolutely cut by the Conservative government for the last 10 years. Sadiq has put point. in 1,300 well, more. But well, there aren't many finished. police officers. 
and the other one is youth youth services around that. It, it's not just about the police to cut the crime on our streets. It's got to be all of, all of that together. In fairness, actually, the government has given more money to the mayor for the, for the Met Police than ever before. So I don't think it's purely a money thing. It's the priorities which are wrong. And the mayor has a role in setting the strategic priorities for the police. So the mayor can't escape from this. The mayor's very good at trying to shift the blame onto others all the time. He's had a big increase in the Met budget. I don't think it's been used wisely. That's partly down to his strategy, but it's also partly down to the priorities of the commissioner and the other senior leadership. Uh, and either way, that's got to change. In the limited time left, I'd like to talk about the troubles at Transport for London. Sarah, uh, there seems to be no breakthrough between the two sides, the government and City Hall, over long-term funding. What do you, where do you see the problem? Well, I mean, my constituents are very, very used to these arguments. We have been trying for over two and a half years now to try and get the funding agreed to repair Hammersmith Bridge, and we always see this kind of ping-pong between DFT and TfL and, you know, Hammersmith and Fulham Council. Uh, and it's always about these, these arguments uh, for, for funding. But, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it is so, so important that we maintain services, uh, bus services, tube services, train services, in and out of our capital city. We need it to maintain our economy. We need it to maintain our cultural sector. And more than anything, we need it uh, for the fight against climate change. We can't get people out of their motor cars if we're not giving them an affordable and accessible alternative. It is absolutely fundamental that we maintain our public transport services and the DFT need to step up and come to the table with a realistic offer. Fleur, the DFT wants Sadiq Khan to come up with ideas for raising money. Is he the problem? Well, TfL has clearly suffered a huge lack of income through COVID, and so it is the government now that needs to foot that bill and not wait until this. Well, the government says it will days. go on filling the funding gap, but if the mayor wants long-term funding, he's got to come up with some ideas of, for raising money. He already has come up with many ideas about how to cut some of the bureaucratic costs of TfL. We do need Hammersmith bridge to be funded and that can only be the government can foot that large bill but also the threat to the tube services and to bus services at the moment is unacceptable we're a couple of days away from the funding running out and this is no way to to work together Bob it seems the government would like Sadiq Khan to adopt what even an official I spoke to called politically unpalatable measures perhaps extending the congestion charge so in, introducing road pricing is that what the government's trying to do get Sadiq to introduce stuff that's going to embarrass him. No, I think I think man needs to get his act together, frankly, because the government has supported TfL through four billion pounds of public money, record sum, uh, because of the loss of fares during COVID. As you rightly say, Simon, Paul Scully, the London minister, said there's another 300 million available by April to maintain that support. But what we haven't seen is any real reform uh, to Transport for London. The mayor has got form for this sort of grandstanding. He did it back in 2018. He said, if you don't give me more money, TfL will go bankrupt. Uh, and he's doing the same scare tactics again. There is no justification whatever uh, uh, for these scare stories about cutting bus routes. The money is there. Well, Bob, thank you. Th thanks to all my guests. Uh, that's it for this year. Thanks to Bob, to Fleur and Sarah. I'll be back next year with a new series of The Late Debate to cover whatever happens in the world of politics in London. Until then, thank you for watching. Have a very good Christmas and good night. <laughs>